verses 1 to 3. In these verses we have I. Something more concerning Stephen and his death, how people stood affected to it variously, as generally in such cases, according to men's different sentiments of things. Christ had said to his disciples, when he was parting with them, JN 1620, You shall weep and lament, but the world shall rejoice. Accordingly here is, 1. Stephen's death rejoiced in by one by many, no doubt, but by one in particular, and that was Saul, who was afterwards called Paul, he was consenting to his death, Sinudoko and he consented to it with delight, so the word signifies, he was pleased with it. He fed his eyes with this bloody spectacle, in hopes it would put a stop to the growth of Christianity. We have reason to think that Paul ordered Luke to insert this, for shame to himself, and glory to free grace. Thus he owns himself guilty of the blood of Stephen, and aggravates it with this, that he did not do it with regret and reluctancy, but with delight and a full satisfaction, like those who not only do such things, but have pleasure in those that do them. 2. Stephen's death bewailed by others, v2, devout men, which some understand of those that were properly so called, proselytes, one of whom Stephen himself probably was. Or, it may be taken more largely, some of the church that were more devout and zealous than the rest went and gathered up the poor crushed and broken remains, to which they gave a decent interment, probably in the field of blood, which was bought some time ago to bury strangers in. They buried him solemnly, and made great lamentation over him. Though his death was of great advantage to himself, and great service to the church, yet they bewailed it as a general loss, so well qualified was he for the service, and so likely to be useful both as a deacon and as a disputant. It is a bad symptom if, when such men are taken away, it is not laid to heart. Those devout men paid these their last respects to Stephen, 1. To show that they were not ashamed of the cause for which he suffered, nor afraid of the wrath of those that were enemies to it, 4. Though they now triumph, the cause is a righteous cause, and will be at last a victorious one. 2. To show the great value and esteem they had for this faithful servant of Jesus Christ, this first martyr for the gospel, whose memory shall always be precious to them, notwithstanding the ignominy of his death. They study to do honor to him upon whom God put honor. 3. To testify their belief and hope of the resurrection of the dead, and the life of the world to come. 2. An account of this persecution of the church, which begins upon the martyrdom of Stephen. When the fury of the Jews ran with such violence, and to such a height, against Stephen, it could not quickly either stop itself or spend itself. The bloody are often in scripture called bloodthirsty, for when they have tasted blood they thirst for more. One would have thought Stephen's dying prayers and dying comforts should have overcome them, and melted them into a better opinion of Christians and Christianity, but it seems they did not, the persecution goes on, for they were more exasperated when they saw they could prevail nothing, and, as if they hoped to be too hard for God himself, they resolved to follow their blow, and perhaps, because they were none of them struck dead upon the place for stoning Stephen, their hearts were the more fully set in them to do evil. Perhaps the disciples were also the more emboldened to dispute against them as Stephen did, seeing how triumphantly he finished his course, which would provoke them so much the more. Observe. 1. Against whom this persecution was raised, it was against the church in Jerusalem, which is no sooner planted than it is persecuted, as Christ often intimated that tribulation and persecution would arise because of the word. And Christ had particularly foretold that Jerusalem would soon be made too hot for his followers, for that city had been famous for killing the prophets and stoning those that were sent to it, MT 2337. It should seem that in this persecution many were put to death, for Paul owns that at this time he persecuted this way unto the death, ch 21 4, and, ch 26 10, that when they were put to death he gave his voice against them. 2. Who was an active man in it, none so zealous, so busy, as Saul, a young Pharisee, v3. As for Saul, who had been twice mentioned before, and now again for a notorious persecutor, he made havoc of the church, he did all he could to lay it waste and ruin it, 
he cared not what mischief he did to the disciples of Christ, nor knew when to stop. He aimed at no less than the cutting off of the Gospel Israel, that the name of it should be no more in remembrance, PS 83,4. He was the fittest tool the chief priests could find out to serve their purposes, he was informer general against the disciples, a messenger of the great council to be employed in searching for meetings, and seizing all that were suspected to favor that way. Saul was bred a scholar, a gentleman, and yet did not think it below him to be employed in the vilest work of that kind. 1. He entered into every house, making no difficulty of breaking open doors, night or day, and having a force attending him for that purpose. He entered into every house where they used to hold their meetings, or every house that had any Christians in it, or was thought to have. No man could be secure in his own house, though it was his castle. 2. He hailed, with the utmost contempt and cruelty, both men and women, dragged them along the streets, without any regard to the tenderness of the weaker sex, he stooped so low as to take cognizance of the meanest that were leavened with the gospel, so extremely bigoted was he. 3. He committed them to prison, in order to their being tried and put to death, unless they would renounce Christ, and some, we find, were compelled by him to blaspheme, ch 26 colon 11. 3. What was the effect of this persecution, they were all scattered abroad, v1, not all the believers, but all the preachers, who were principally struck at it, and against whom warrants were issued out to take them up. They, remembering our master's rule, when they persecute you in one city, flee to another, dispersed themselves by agreement throughout the regions of Judea and of Samaria, not so much for fear of sufferings, for Judea and Samaria were not so far off from Jerusalem but that, if they made a public appearance there, as they determined to do, their persecutors' power would soon reach them there, but because they looked upon this as an intimation of providence to them to scatter. Their work was pretty well done in Jerusalem, and now it was time to think of the necessities of other places, for their master had told them that they must be his witnesses in Jerusalem first, and then in all Judea and in Samaria, and then to the uttermost part of the earth, ch 1,8, and this method they observe. Through persecution may not drive us off from our work, yet it may send us, as a hint of providence, to work elsewhere. The preachers were all scattered except the apostles, who, probably, were directed by the Spirit to continue at Jerusalem yet for some time, they being, by the special providence of God, screened from the storm, and by the special grace of God enabled to face the storm. They tarried at Jerusalem, that they might be ready to go where their assistance was most needed by the other preachers that were sent to break the ice, as Christ ordered his disciples to go to those places where he himself designed to go, L.U. 10 1. The apostles continued longer together at Jerusalem than one would have thought, considering the command and commission given them, to go into all the world, and to disciple all nations. CCH 15 6, Gallon 1 17. But what was done by the evangelists whom they sent forth was reckoned as done by them.